You bet. You bet. Excellent. So thank you for coming. And I want to welcome Nelson from the Zhang Yi Kung Fu Association, who's going to tell us about his organization um, and what they do. So thank you. I'll turn it over to Nelson. Thank you, Anne. And again, thank you for the ED Lock uh, Public Library for inviting me over to, to talk a little bit about Chinese martial arts and culture and, you know, Zhang Yi Kung Fu Association, which is where uh, I'm actually transmitting from here. Uh, this is our school. And uh, we're located on the east side of Madison, uh, on just on East Washington. So, and currently we're only open for members because of the pandemic. So, uh, but in July, we will be open to the public again, uh, if, if things continue improving, of course. <laughs> so, but for the time being, we only are open for, uh, for our members. Uh, but we have a website and Facebook page and you, know, you can always look us up for that. So, um, you know, with that in mind, I guess we'll go on to the presentation here. Um, you know, again, it's great to be here, especially, you know, since it's, uh, you know, Pacific Islander and Asian uh, Cultural Heritage Month, a uh, great celebration. It's a good way to, you know, share these things. And this is something that we always look forward to um, sharing with our uh, community, uh, the traditions that we have. Um, and because uh, Chinese martial arts has a very rich uh, cultural tradition uh, and, and there's a specific martial culture, not just talking about the Chinese uh, people's culture is of course a very rich uh, and uh, deep history, but you know, Chinese martial arts has culture in itself. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. And I hope that you all enjoy. And at the end, we'll have a open up if anybody wanted to ask any questions, more than welcome to do so. So, so first thing, we'll talk very briefly about the history of Chinese martial arts. I'm not gonna, uh, I, I do actually teach seminars on, on uh, the history of Chinese martial arts. And usually these seminars are very, uh, very long. They can, uh, I think the shortest one I've done, although this would probably be the shortest one, but the shortest one I've done was actually two hours long, but there's like, some seminars that I've had like do uh, over, uh, you know, several hours and throughout the day. Uh, but, you know, I just want to kind of give a little introduction about Chinese martial arts. I think that a lot of times people kind of have a uh, misunderstanding of uh, where the history of the Chinese martial arts are. So I guess, you know, the beginning of the Chinese martial arts, a lot of people uh, sometimes think that the beginning of the martial art of Chinese martial arts started in the uh, Shaolin Temple. There's a picture there, the uh, front entrance of the Shaolin Temple there, one of the gates there, um, or the main building. Um, and, but that's actually not true. Um, the temple itself, you know, was actually built in 495 uh, AD or uh, Christian era. And, but Chinese martial arts and, and the Chinese people have had a history of, uh, of, uh, you know, long, long, long before uh, the temple was ever built. So kind of going into that, just talk a little bit, uh, just so you can have an idea, there's actually evidence prior to the Shang Dynasty, but you know, Shang Dynasty, which we're talking about 1600 BC to 1046 BC, pretty much the Bronze Age. So like we're talking kind of like, you know, prehistoric times, like very primitive times, right? Uh, so there's historical evidence that the martial arts were being practiced by the military and civilians alike since primitive times in China. And we're talking about concepts of military and, and um, civilian martial arts is not, not how we look at it nowadays, of course. It's a very, very different uh, back then in primitive times. Uh, but over the past few millennia, these practices took shape and became codified into what we know now as Kung Fu. So in the West, the word Kung Fu is usually used to uh, uh, denominate what Chinese martial arts is. A lot of us in the Chinese martial arts uh, schools prefer to use the term Chinese martial arts, a little bit better uh, applicable. I'll get into that a little bit later about the term Kung Fu. But uh, but yeah, we just, you know, so what you see nowadays, of course, has been uh, development of, you know, uh, several uh, uh, thousands of years. Uh, uh, the use of weapons for wars and defense uh, is well documented by ar archaeologists, uh, you know, throughout history. Uh, however, primordial military practices and tactics are quite different from what we see in the modern age. So it's, you know, important to understand that when we're talking about having this long history, 
it, it's a development, you know, just like everything, things move um, and they develop. So you have these, you know, pretty much somebody picking up a stick and defending themselves by using the stick or, or even throwing a punch or kicking somebody, um, you know, and they eventually say, hey, this works well, you know, you should learn how to do this. And you already start the primitive levels of martial arts, which is essentially somebody uh, codifying some method of, of uh, protection or defense and, uh, you know, and essentially teaching it. So... Uh, so we're going to fast forward here uh, into like around the uh, times of Confucius, which we're talking about 551 BC to 479 BC. That's the time that he was uh, uh, alive. And uh, it's interesting to know that Confucius, even though it's very well known for Confucianism, right, the, the whole, uh, uh, his philosophy, you know, and how to deal with the concepts of benevolence, uh, uh, you know, righteousness, all of those things are things that he, you know, held dear to. But he also advocated for the study of martial arts. Um, in his times, the, the study would actually include archery and charioteering, which were considered martial arts, like learning how to actually uh, uh, properly guide a chariot with, and there were a whole bunch of rules on how to actually uh, guide the chariot and that type of stuff. So it would stabilize for the archer. And if you look at the picture here, you essentially have like these four horses, which, you know, it's not necessarily a very easy way to, to charioteer. Um, and you have person in the middle is, uh, you know, the one that's guiding it. You have an uh, archer on uh, the left side of the uh, the person that's uh, guiding the horses. And uh, there's a man using what's called a gu, which is kind of, they call it a, a hook spear or a, a hook blade. Uh, it's kind of almost like a sickle with the spear tip on the top of it that was used for sweeping motions. And and so those were three different types of uh, techniques that, that people would have to learn. And, and it's also interesting to know that in ancient times in China, actually, uh, it was the nobles that actually that fought. Uh, the whole concept of conscription by uh, peasants and that type of stuff is something that came much later. Um, but so you had these nobles that would actually, you know, need to know, you know, how to use these weapons. Um, and they, and there's even a hierarchy with it. So the person in the chariot, number one, person with the arrow, number two, and the person with the, with the go was the uh, third one. Um, but they had to work together to, you know, achieve their objectives. So um, in this time, uh, the studies would include, as I said, archery and charioterian, besides things like, you know, music, music and uh, writing and math and those other uh, concepts, right? Um, there was even like tournaments during that time where practitioners could uh, measure their skills for archery, for example. There's even like Confucian ritualistic uh, archery and a uh, very interesting concept that to this day in Chinese martial arts is still present, which is like, uh, overshooting the target and undershooting the target is just as bad. Uh, the only thing that you should focus on is, it, and you should be proud of, should be actually hitting the target. So when you're training and you're studying martial arts, it's the same thing. You don't want to overtrain, you don't want to undertrain, you want to do it just right, and you want to always be able to hit your objectives uh, correctly. So, um, so moving forward, like I said, Shaolin Temple was founded in uh, 495. Uh, a lot of people think it was like a, a fighting temple or like a university of martial arts, but uh, the reality of it is that it was uh, created <clears throat> uh, for this monk called Batuo. And uh, he was uh, uh, in charge of essentially translating the Indian sutras, right, from Sanskrit into Chinese uh, for Buddhism to be spread throughout China. So the, the main purpose of the Shaolin Temple and for the reason for it being built was the concept of actually dissemination of, uh, of, uh, the, of Buddhism. And eventually you come up with this, uh, 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 the 28th patriarch of Buddhism, uh, known as Bodhidharma uh, in Chinese, Dhammo, uh, went to the temple and actually stayed there and became very famous. He's very well uh, known as the relation between uh, Shaolin Temple and uh, Dhammo Bodhidharma. Uh, and he's actually the patriarch of uh, what we call Zen Buddhism or Chan in Chinese. Um, so a lot of people like to attribute the uh, Shaolin Temple as being kind of the birthplace for Chinese Zen Buddhism. Um, but it's interesting to know that <clears throat> Why is it that you have the martial arts there? Um, a lot of people don't realize this, but any large Chinese temple, um, through, and this is like throughout history, would always have sort of a, a militia that would protect it, 
uh, you know, people could come in and rob temples and stuff like that. So they would have a militia. The militia was always, you know, young, uh, young men, you know, in this case with the younger monks that would there to, you know, protect the older monks and uh, the temple in itself. So they created a militia and they had militias and very various different uh, temples had these. And as a matter of fact, there are other temples that did martial arts uh, as well in terms of having militias. And the concept of militia is also important to understand that each village would have a militia and many times those militias would develop a style in particular so so in a way i guess you could say that this concept of shaolin temple having like these martial monks and stuff is like good of the militia members and they ended up learning and training these different uh uh weapons like uh the staff is uh um uh, very famous for the the temple but other weapons were taught as well including hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, another thing i don't want to uh skip over and it's really important to kind of going back into primordial times was uh it's it's written and recorded that in the shaolin temple when the temple was actually uh, built there was already uh, monks that enjoyed doing a uh, type of chinese folk wrestling um which is actually very prevalent with the uh, with the uh, <clears throat> military as well and this this uh this type of uh, wrestling is very primitive. Wrestling is a very primitive uh, art form uh, that has evolved over you know millennia again, um, and you know so there's already something like that. So again, th that's another concept within what you would have of what we call martial arts, and, and both military styles and um, uh, folk styles as well. So so you can see this whole idea of the Shaolin Temple, which a lot of people are very. Uh, it is a very known temple uh, for its monks, for fierce warriors and whatnot. But, but in reality, it was there for, you know, translating the sutras, disseminating Buddhism throughout China. And, you know, it just had a, a fame for, for this. So, and our style that we teach here at the school uh, is supposed to be uh, from kind of like a, you could say, a time capsule of the 1700s in China uh, for, the, for the temple. Uh, or what was taught there. So, and the reason why I say supposed to is because we don't really have any historical evidence uh, of it. Um, we have uh, very famous practitioners that you know, go back hundreds of years, but, but nothing that's specifically, you know, stating that it's, uh, uh, you know, it, it came from here and here. So just want to make sure that that's something that's clear. So there's a lot of fables, a lot of concepts and a lot of uh, really interesting stories about the Shaolin Temple um, and how it to a certain degree has impacted Chinese martial arts. However, uh, military has impacted the Chinese martial arts uh, just as much, if not even more, um, and different dynasties having their different militaries and even villages like the very famous one is the Chen village, Tai Chi, you know, they have huge impact on the, the martial arts as well. So next person that I'm going to talk about in terms of impacts, too, is uh, this general called Qi Ji Guang. Uh, he lived between 1528 and 1588, Christian era. So, uh, and he's actually considered one of the, one of the more famous generals uh, in China. They have illustrious uh, uh, generals uh, throughout history, uh, some such as uh, Guan Yu from the Three Kingdoms period. Uh, he's even, you know, kind of got deified. Uh, so, but General Qi Ji Guang was really uh, important because he wrote a book called the new, uh, the new Book on Military Discipline. And he taught this idea of uh, having uh, techniques uh, that are less flowery or more, you know, uh, combative, uh, how to actually train uh, troops properly. It was a very codified book that he wrote uh, and giving uh, instructions and, and like uh, handsets and, you know, how is it that you do techniques and uh uh, even how to do combat and strategies and those type of things. And the concepts of strategies and, and uh, verbal formulas for these type of things is, again, something that's been going on for thousands of years in China. Um, you have very famous strategists like Sun Tzu. Um, there's very famous books written about strategy as well. Um, and, you know, other um, documents too. There's a very famous one called the Maiden in Yue, which is considered the very first of the uh, books that, uh, or texts about what Chinese martial arts is really about, talking about concepts such as uh, uh, yin and yang, you know, so negative and positive and that type of stuff, and how it's used within combat. So, and as I said, he advocated the troops to train in realistic and less flowery methods, which 
a lot of people will call folk Chinese martial arts versus military martial arts. There's kind of a division between what you'd call civil and military in China, uh, what they call wen and wu. Uh, so a lot of times the more flowery techniques are a little bit more like a folky sort of way of presenting the martial arts and the less more kind of, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat sort of thing. That's the more military way of looking at it. Um, and he was actually really famous for using the term, the practical is not pretty and the pretty is not practical. A lot of people, you know, it sounds something like, you know, Bruce Lee would say, <laughs> but, you know, it's a good example here of, uh, you know, this is something that's been going on for a long, long time in Chinese martial arts uh, history is the criticism of uh, flowery techniques versus non-flowery techniques. So uh, now moving forward into the 20th century, uh, the next thing that I would say, you know, this is right before the fall of the uh, Qing Empire in 1911. And you get this uh, association called the Jing Wu Athletic Association. It was founded in 1909. It was actually a, a, not just martial arts, but athletic. Like they had cycling team and they had shop put teams and uh, weightlifting. They had all sorts of uh, different uh, things in this association. But their thing was a martial, it was a martial arts school that had all these other things within them and it really molded and shaped uh, the way we look at modern uh, martial arts schools uh, and also methodologies of teaching and curriculums and that type of stuff. So um, Huo Yin Jia was the father of the Jing Wu. For those that have seen the movie Fearless, it's loosely based on, on him. Uh, and uh, and actually, if you've seen the movie too, uh, Bruce Lee had a movie called um, Chinese Connection, which was uh, supposed to be his Huo Wenjia student coming back. Uh, the Chinese name of the movie is uh, Jingwu Men, which is literally like the, the, the Jingwu uh, group. And Jet Li also made one called uh, Fist of Legend. And so it's, it's kind of like a retelling of that Bruce Lee story. But again, it's the you know, master of the Jingwu. So it had a huge impact on the Chinese martial arts and its culture. It really modernized the concept of teaching and promotion traditional Chinese martial arts to the public. Uh, many ways it kind of got out of the whole idea that we're using this as a tool uh, for uh, survival into a recreational method that's good and beneficial for your health. So the next step that we have is this concept of Guosu or Guosu uh, Central Academy. Um, it was fun, founded by the government, the nationalist government in China in uh, 1928. It was really short-lived because it kind of, World War II got in the way. So uh, the Sino-Japanese War happened in 1937 and that kind of, you know, disrupted the activities quite a bit. The, the institute tried to move around, but it just ultimately was just not able to, you know, hold its foot. But so it had a golden era though, from 28 to 37, in which they published books and and even uh, they filmed uh, movies and that type of stuff uh, and instructional movies. Uh, and they had an institute, and the institutes were throughout China, kind of like the coastal area of China. Many of the major cities had one, and uh, and this is kind of like a next level of the Jingwu. You kind of have this uh, Guosu movement, you know, coming into into terms, and they even hosted tournaments. A uh, very famous tournament in 1928 in Nanjing was the very first one they hosted, which they did uh, forms competition, which kind of like prearranged movements uh, with your hands or, or with weapons and that type of stuff. And they had stuff like archery um, and including full contact fighting. So they actually had, the, in which has been a long tra held tradition within Chinese martial arts, the concept of uh, uh, fighting. So <clears throat> the term Wosu literally means uh, nation and art. So it's supposed to be used to create pride and for, uh, to the fact that Kung Fu, as we know it, uh, was a national treasure. Uh, if you look at many of the buildings or many of the traditional associations, they don't use the word Kung Fu in their Chinese name. They actually have the term Guo Su um, in, the, in the name of the organization. So, so, and then of course, you know, kind of move on to the next thing is the Chinese people's immigration and diaspora. <clears throat> you know, the Chinese people have been migrating like through <laughs> centuries uh, throughout uh, Southeast Asia and the rest of the world. Um, and of course, in the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, there's a lot more movement and it kind of picked up. And with that, they brought their favorite pastimes and cultural activities and things like you know, 
martial arts, of course, and something that I think most people are pretty familiar with is uh, uh, lion dancing and dragon dancing. Those are uh, for Chinese New Year's, so Chinese New Year celebrations. You know, it's a good time to to see those type of things. All of those things are brought with them because you know, again, their favorite pastimes are things that they felt were important and part of their culture. And uh, with same thing, you get people like Bruce Lee uh, being able to to start disseminating. Uh, what he learned and and other teachers as well and uh, and this sort of like a globalization of the martial arts in which people from all over get to learn martial arts. My teacher, for example, had moved from mainland China. He uh, actually in 1948, he retreated to Taiwan uh, with the nationalist government. And in the early 70s, he actually moved to Brazil, which is actually where I was raised. Uh, and in Brazil, uh, he taught his martial arts, just like many people have taught the Chinese martial arts here in the United States and Canada and uh, uh, other places too that have large populations uh, throughout uh, the Americas, such as uh, Peru. A lot of people don't know that Peru actually has a very large population. Mexico also has a pretty big population. Uh, not to mention, of course, places like Malaysia and Singapore, uh, Indonesia uh, and Southeast Asia that have you know, large populations as well. Uh, and with that, they disseminated and brought their arts with them. And many people that were not of Chinese uh, ancestry uh, ended up being fortunate enough to learn these arts from their from these masters. So, uh, so we'll go on to the Northern Shaolin style <clears throat> first. You know, kind of very briefly uh, uh, talk a little bit about the style that we teach here. So this is one style. Chinese martial arts has many, 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 many styles. Uh, they say that at one point they cataloged uh, over a hundred different styles of, uh, style of um, Chinese martial arts. Uh, some people say that's even more than that. But the style in particular that we teach at our school is called Northern Shaolin. Okay. And uh, Northern Shaolin style, not to be confused with what's being done at the Shaolin Temple nowadays. Nowadays they do, a lot of people differentiate the two by calling it Songshan Shaolin versus Northern Shaolin. Uh, and the Northern Shaolin style that we do is specifically this gentleman that you're seeing the picture there. Uh, his name is Guru Zhang. So, uh, so Grandmaster Guru Zhang was born in 1894. Uh, he is famous for his iron palm and iron body techniques, which are kind of what we call internal training techniques. Uh, you can see, look at it as like breathing techniques that kind of strengthen your body and you know strengthen your hand. Uh, these are methods that we teach at the school here. So, and he was one of the fighting champions of the 1928 National Chinese Martial Arts Tournament in Nanjing that I had previously mentioned about the Guozhou movement. Um, so he's known for his fighting. As a matter of fact, he was so good that they ended up asking him to teach at uh, the Central Academy, uh, <clears throat> along with some other uh, famous masters as well. So, so the style of Northern Shaolin is this one in particular that we're talking about. Uh, there are other styles that get denominated as Northern Shaolin. They're all from the same area, but they do have very uh, variants on it. So Grandmaster Guru Zhang's Northern Shaolin style specifically has a, a you know, these are kind of like the examples of what's on there. There's essentially 10 core handsets. Uh, they, uh, they're from simple to complex. <clears throat> some of them are highly acrobatic, some of them are less so. Uh, there's also four supplemental handsets that we teach here at the school. Uh, and when I say handset, I mean prearranged movements that look like blocking and evading and uh, punching and kicking uh, put together uh, to form a cohesive unit to teach the student what the uh, main concepts and strategies are within the system. Uh, there's also eight two-person sets. Uh, there's a uh, uh, 18 classical weapons that are taught within the system as well. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. Uh, and then Qigong and special skills. Like I said, iron palm body, uh, iron palm and iron body um, uh, skills and these type of what we call internal training, uh, breathing exercise and meditative practices, uh, as well as theories, practices and strategies that go, that are very, very specific to the style uh, that are taught. And all of this is we try to, Make sure the students understand them and, and uh, study them. And, and, uh, and as I said, it, it's a deep and uh, rich uh, style, just like Chinese martial arts in general. So um, it takes quite a long time to, to master it. So, uh, so with the weapons, we you know we have saber, also known as a broadsword. We have three of the different type. We have, so like there's like a beginner, intermediate, and advanced. 
Same thing goes with the staff and the sword. Some people call it a straight sword <clears throat> and spear. There's three different versions. Uh, cane, which is kind of funny because, you know, the cane set that we have, if you actually would need to use a cane, you would not be able to perform the set. It's got chumps and stuff like that in it. Uh, there's a fan, so like a fighting fan. This is actually much more of a newer addition within the system. <clears throat> uh, double daggers. Uh, the whole section of double sets, which are double daggers and double sabers and double swords and double hook swords. <clears throat> uh, also flexible weapons like two sectional staff, three sectional staff, nine section whip. Uh, and then you also have these long bladed weapons like well, what they call a dashing blade, also known as a poodle. Uh, monk spade, which is there's essentially a spade on one side and kind of like a half crescent moon on the other side. Uh, you probably can see one behind me uh, over my shoulder. Uh, the halberd, which is known as a G, um, and also the crescent blade, uh, some people call it a guandao. So those are all weapons that are taught within the system. Uh, we like to make sure that the students get to uh, study them and uh, they can explore these different concepts uh, within the art. So it's a, it's a good way to not just think about it as learning how to use the weapon, but also how to learn how to control uh, the weapon or uh, even how to use your body as, and as a conduit to extend into the weapon uh, to create more power and generate more force or, or to even understand concepts like, for example, you can really think about how you're throwing a punch from the way that you're thrusting your spear. So all of those parts, all of, it's not just a matter of teaching how to use the weapon, it's a matter of understanding the art as a whole. So uh, next thing that comes up is uh, also there's these two person sets. So a two person, there's a two person combat set, which is essentially two, it looks like two people fighting, but it's all prearranged movements. Again, teaching the student the uh, core values and principles within the system. This in many ways would be the step between starting to have the student learn how to fight uh, and the moving out of doing just a regular form. So there's a individual practice, there's paired practice, and then there's free fighting prayer. Uh, paired practice. So those would be kind of like the two different or steps into learning how to fight traditionally speaking. Uh, there's also staff versus staff, sword versus sword, saber versus spear, uh, three section staff versus spear, uh, double sabers versus spear, and double hook swords versus spear, and also the guandao or the crescent blade versus spear. As you can see, the spear appears quite a bit as the opponent, and one of the reasons why is because the spear is known as the king of all weapons, and it's a very difficult weapon uh, in many ways to uh, outmaneuver uh, because it has reach and it has a blade, and also, you know, uh, it, it, so it's a difficult weapon. It's also, it used to be a very common weapon to be used in, on the battlefield, so, um, so understanding how to be able to to uh, fight against it would help you in many ways in understanding how to, to use your weapon correctly against even other weapons uh, per se. So again, the whole thing is to try to teach the student concepts such as timing and distance and, and you know, how to uh, bring out their, uh, you could say, fighting spirit so it can continue going on to moving towards a free fighting rather than a prearranged way of fighting. Uh, <clears throat> the next thing, that we teach here besides the style is the Sarping Lion Dance. And this is a picture of uh, the uh, members of the world organization. Uh, my master is in the middle, right behind the white uh, haired lion uh, wearing a black shirt. Uh, this picture was taken actually in China when we were there for uh, visiting the ancestral home of the um, of our style. Sarping is actually the name of a village um, in uh, China. Uh, it's southern portion of China and in the Hushan, uh, the city of Hushan in the province of Guangdong. So uh, the name of my, my master is Chan Siu Ki. He lives in Singapore <clears throat> currently. He's the third generation inheritor of the grandmaster of the Sarping Liu Pai lion dance style. Uh, he's world famous as the lion drum king. Uh, if you were to go on YouTube and you type in Lion Drum King, you'll be able to see videos of him uh, playing the drum. He's very famous for it. And I'm actually his uh, direct disciple. So I have uh, been studying with him since 2013. Uh, and he officially accepted me as his disciple in 2017. Uh, I went all the way to Singapore to do a ceremony called the Bai Shir, which is to uh, essentially become a disciple of your master. Uh, this is something I had done previously with my Kung Fu master, which uh, his name is uh, 
Dr. Wu Chaoxiang. As I said, he had moved to Brazil and uh, uh, and he unfortunately passed away in 2000. <clears throat> and because of that, not having a master's, it's very difficult to, you know, continue being able to learn. Although the, our school is actually dedicated to his memory. So uh, we want to make sure that we promote and continue teaching what he taught us. But uh, we also now are dedicated to teaching and promoting the style of uh, Sarping Lion Dance uh, through my master. So in a way, like I was saying, there's the when and the who. There is a civil and then there's a martial. If you look on our, uh, over my shoulder here to the right side, there are a bunch of weapons representing the marshal and right next to me here is a lion but there's several other lions that we have over here um and that's the uh when or the civil side so the concept in a martial arts school traditional chinese martial arts school is to teach a balance between when and wu teach uh what is uh, uh you know she can look at it as as uh, martial and civil and having that education uh, is supposed to form a complete piece of what the citizen should be somebody who is a culturally aware uh, you know high uh, uh, high level of learning and at the same time understanding how to defend themselves uh, to not just protect their family themselves their community and so forth and so on so uh he and then, as I said, my grandmaster, you get to see him uh, pretty much every every year. We get to, you know, either go there or he comes to the, to the States. So always a good time. My students love seeing him. Um, the system that we teach of Sarping here at the ZY Cafe, there are 18 different drum patterns. Uh, uh, and also cymbal and gongs are played within the, those 18. So you, students have to learn these things. Uh, and, and it does take a while. Even people who are musically trained have some sort of a hard time getting some of this because it is complicated, although it's beautiful to listen to. Uh, there's also 18 chord steps with mer many variants. So we have these 18 chord steps that match the 18 patterns of the drums or the music. Um, and within the, you have variants uh, within those uh, core steps that you can do. There's uh, seven postures that the student needs to master. There's also like eight lion actions. Some people like to call it emotions, but there are actions that the lion needs to do. And of course, being under a lion is difficult because you have big people marche, uh, lion, and the eyes move and the mouth moves and you have to make it look alive. It's not just kind of putting on a, a costume and walking around. You're supposed to actually be a lion and really show your energy there. So uh, there's also uh, six traditional line dance sets, like forms that we that we have to learn as well. Uh, and there's also what they call a big headed monk and his actions. So just another part of what we teach. And people who've seen our performances have seen somebody walking out and has a big Buddha head on and, and going around with a fan and kind of teasing the lion. So all of that's part of what we teach and uh, we love performing for our community when we do that. Uh, the third thing that we'd like to talk about quickly is the Chinese kickboxing. So the Lei Tai or platform fighting has existed in China since ancient times. As I said, you have wrestling, you have all sorts of martial arts uh, ideas in China. Uh, in 1928, there was the movement to modernize the arts by the government. Like I said, the Boston movement uh, included free fighting among different styles of combat. Uh, so in a way, it's very much like the concept of what MMA was, right? So uh, it's it's just a, like, I guess you could say a Chinese version of it. <clears throat> Uh, and they had to create uh, rules and certain rule sets. An interesting rule set, for example, is that uh, once the fighter hits the ground, you stop fighting. So, which is, you know, not something that, you know, is done, you know, in modern days uh, MMA. So, uh, again, it's cultural differences for that. Uh, and then currently two of the most common types are Gosu Leitai and Sanda, also known as Sanso, are the two different types of which keep sport fighting within China or within Chinese communities. So uh, the system at ZY Cafe, it's something that's all levels and interests uh, can go into the intro combat sports, intro to combat sports, which is kind of like a beginner level program that we have here. Then we have a Sanda, which is, uh, um, I'll go get into that a little bit, which is a more intermediate level. And then you have the Gosu Leitai, which is a more advanced way of fighting. And then there's competition teams. So you can actually be part of this without ever competing or you can, you know, certainly if you're the competitive type, that's something that's available for you too. Uh, as a matter of fact, we do compete with our Northern Shaolin with forms, weapons and that type of stuff. We go to karate tournaments and, and Chinese martial arts tournaments as well. And we even compete in international uh, 
uh, events, uh, not just for Kung Fu and uh, Chinese kickboxing, but also for lion dancing. As a matter of fact, 2019, we took third place at, in Macau, China, uh, with our lion dance team. So first time the U.S. has uh, gotten top three in um, lion dancing. Uh, you know, was with us. Uh, so it was very, very cool. We were very proud of the work that the, our team did. So, uh, so Sanda, it was, uh, like I was saying, it's created originally with the Chinese army. It was eventually became a popular sport for the general population in the 1980s, late 1980s. Uh, it includes punches, kicks, throws, and uh, uh, takedowns. I <laughs> see that put throws there twice, but uh, throws and takedowns. And uh, it's fought in an open ring, a late time, I'll show it picture in a minute of that uh some famous fighters are in the ufc right now are uh kung lee uh zhang wei lee uh she just had a huge fight uh recently um against uh rose not yama Yunus. and you also have muslim salikov and uh yan shaunan which is actually going to be fighting uh this weekend so in the ufc so it's a sport that's becoming very very popular and a lot of the people um after they get done with their sanda they sometimes move into that direction of going into the MMA field. Um, there's also Guo Su Lei Tai, or not, also the equipment that you see there, uh, chest protector, head protector, gloves, sometimes shin pads are a part of the equipment that they use. Uh, Guo Su Lei Tai, which began in its roots in that 1928 Nanjing tournament that I was talking about, uh, had its first world championships in 75 in Taiwan and includes the uses of punches, kicks, elbows and knees, which is not something you're using in Asanda, uh, and takedowns and throws as well. Uh, it's fought on an open ring, and there's an annual national international championship that takes place in Maryland uh, called the U.S. Uh, KSF uh, that the ZRKFA has participated since 93 in there. I even fought at that tournament uh, way back in the day. And uh, it, it, we have several titles and individuals on the team that have competed there and won. Uh, we've won titles as well in forms, uh, competitions as well. Um, so it's a really good place. We've been the lion dancers over there for them for their opening ceremonies. So, And the equipment that you see is also MMA style gloves, so that open finger, and that helmet with the cage. You don't have chest protectors, you don't have shin pads for this uh, type of fighting. <clears throat> so going on to lay tie. Uh, a lay tie is an open ring. Right, so there's no ropes. The fighters score points for forcing or throwing their opponents off of the ring. Uh, it can measure between 20 by 20 or 30 by 30 feet. And it can be anywhere between two to two and a half feet off the ground. And that's where the fighting, Chinese martial arts fighting happens. So uh, I guess, you know, in modern combat sports, you have a ring, right? Like a boxing ring style, uh, or you have the cage. Um, and this is sort of the Chinese, you know, platform for fighting that they use. As a matter of fact, you can see in Beijing in 2008, they had a championship there. <clears throat> so a little bit about us, just kind of, so we can talk a little bit about, more about what we do. Uh, we essentially have three, what we call three jewels for ZY Cafe, which is our Chinese kickboxing, our Northern Shaolin, our Sarping Lion Dance. Uh, we like to think about as Chinese martial culture is what we're teaching, not just fighting, uh, not just philosophy. Uh, we want to always make sure our learn, students learn and then they practice and then they apply. And we always want to pursue excellent, because, excellence because our tradition is progression. This is something that my, my master and my shifu had taught me. Uh, I want to make sure I pass that along to my students. So, so programs at our school are designed for youth starting at age seven and adults. Uh, membership is about 80% adults and 20% our kids under 13 so unlike a lot of martial arts schools that you see out there where it's mostly kids and a little bit of adults here it's the exact opposite we actually have a lot of adults in here and a few kids uh but we are everybody is welcome uh we're very you know welcoming uh, uh community here so we do have non-competitive and competitive pursuits alike so if you wanted to come in just work out just kind of get your you know, Kung Fu on, as some people say, uh, you're more than welcome to do so. If you want to really take it seriously, you know, can, you know, you start competing, you can compete regionally, uh, nationally, internationally, or even go to world championships. We have done it all. So uh, we also have youth summer programs. <clears throat> and the whole concept for us is focus, you know, mind focus, uh, fitness, and have some fun. So I want to make sure everybody's enjoying what they're doing. Uh, 
programs in class, like I said, Northern Shaolin, Sarping Lion Dance, Chinese kickboxing, competition teams. We have Neigong, which are breathing and meditation practices. <coughs> and, you know, we also have additional programs that we do on and off, such as uh, uh, weapon fighting. Uh, we, we teach people how to use the weapons in a combative uh, environment. <coughs> we also have the fitness facility on the back that people can go ahead and use weightlifting equipment and that type of stuff, heavy bags and all of that's part of our programming classes. And as you can see in the picture there, on the left side, you see all the weapons. On the right side, you see all the lions. That's again, one of those concepts of when and wu, you have civil and martial. Uh, one thing that our school does is travel around the world. <coughs> we travel to attend seminars to further our knowledge with our masters and grandmasters uh, or to compete. So in the picture here on the left, uh, this is us in Brazil. <coughs> I should say part of the team in Brazil um, and Sao Paulo in particular for the uh, 2016 uh, international championship there. We got many, many gold medals from the event, both in fighting and forms. And we even did a lion dance for the grand opening. Uh, <clears throat> Singapore with my master and uh, his wife, which calls Shifu and Shumu. And uh, people that, some of my students and friends that weren't there uh, for the BIC, but we've been to uh, Singapore for training. Uh, Macau, <clears throat> which is uh, the picture on the right, which we've competed at the International uh, Lion Dance Championships there. Uh, this have just took third place in 2019. That was right before the pandemic. <clears throat> and, uh, and we've been to Malaysia and Germany for world championships, Argentina. Uh, so we've been in several parts of the world. And, uh, and for us, it's really important to be able to the idea is travel the world, make friends through martial arts. And that's what we want to do is just show our best foot forward about what Madison and Wisconsin is all about to everybody else out there <clears throat> and through our love of the Chinese arts. So some cultural considerations you'd want to think about. Uh, Chinese martial arts has unique culture and customs for its practitioners to learn about and explore. We, it starts out with something as simple as what you see there, that salute, which is your right fist and your left palm together. Yeah, some people like to think about it as you have the yin and the yang, you know, put together in harmony. Um, you know, other ways of looking at it is like uh, acknowledging the brightness in the other person. Uh, it's a very old uh, symbol within uh, Chinese culture that in Chinese martial arts is always used at the beginning or end of the practice or when you're going to be practicing with somebody else. It's a sign of respect. In many ways, some people like to make it akin to like the namaste uh, from uh, that's used in India. <clears throat> Uh, so with that in mind, and, and this is just one example, there's several other examples, of course, and I would be talking here all day if I was to do that, but uh, it's a great way to understand not just the martial side, but also the general Chinese people's culture as a whole. It's a good way, you know, training traditional Chinese martial arts makes you understand the bigger picture and the bigger culture and how the world can be connected. Uh, language, cultural meanings, philosophies, and concepts are all explored within our school for students of all ages. So, you know, we, there will be concepts of Taoism, and Confucianism, and uh, uh, Buddhism or whatnot, not, not as a religion, but as a thought school a school of, of thought uh or to understand certain concepts uh besides their own you know martial culture things that you have within lion dance and and uh you know meeting other schools there's all sorts of really interesting rich uh history for that not to mention the food there's lots of really great food especially during chinese new years <laughs> so um so community is a big thing for us and you know we want to make sure that we go to festivals and celebrate some pictures here of like uh, us at the Overture Center. Uh, we always do a performance there, but we usually go out with our lion dance team and uh, do lion dance performances or Kung Fu performances if people ask so. So we go and do outreach and uh, show people the equipment or talk a little bit about the art or even have talks like this that we're doing right now through Zoom, but in person. <clears throat> pre-pandemic, of course. <laughs> so hopefully we can get back to doing those things, but that's all part of what we want to do is make sure that people, you know, see the beauty and richness of the art and also get to know all of us. You know, I think that, you know, we're blessed to have some wonderful students here and uh, being able to go out there and, and do great things. So some of the values and philosophies, just as we're wrapping up here, um, the mission for our school is to promote and provide quality instruction in Chinese martial arts and culture to our community. That's 
pretty much our mission. And, you know, the vision is to be an active and positive influence on its members, martial arts community and society in general. Uh, we will promote physical fitness and friendship, unity and peace in our context with others while cultivating a tradition of compassion, progression and excellence in our teaching methods. So that's kind of the vision for the school. That's, you know, we always try to push that forward. Uh, we have these these four anchor concepts, which is essentially to have a sense of courtesy, a sense of justice, a sense of honesty and a sense of ethics. I think it's important for our students. Uh, and then we also have these guidelines, which we look at it as, you know, we have loyalty, feel of piety, benevolence, compassion, trustworthiness, grace or calmness, uh, righteousness, and harmony, which are things we want to make sure our students always try to strive for, trying to be their best. Uh, one of the things that define us, there's a very famous martial arts saying that's uh, the martial world is one family. Uh, but 